This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on security pitfalls for embedded systems. There are a number of security pitfalls that await the unwary embedded system designer. If your system uses any of the following, then you probably have fallen into one of these common security pitfalls. If your system uses a master password that is the same across multiple units that you produce, then your system is insecure. If you use homemade cryptography instead of a standard algorithm, then it is very likely that your system is insecure. If you use encryption to ensure integrity instead of using a secure hash or digital signature, then it is easy for you to have some sort of security problem. If you make unrealistic security assumptions, such as assuming that users will pick strong passwords, then you might have a security problem. And finally, if your design hinges upon the idea of security via obscurity, then you're not really secure. As a simple example of the kind of thing that goes wrong, if you have a secret master password and only tell it to trusted colleagues, then eventually, most likely, it will get loose. Consider the sequence up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA which was originally a secret way to get power-ups in a video game and was only supposed to be used for testing. That sequence eventually got loose and has become so famous as the Konami code that there are whole websites dedicated to that code. There's an example of trying to keep a secret that got loose. Deploying good security can be counterintuitive. In particular, attacks are generally a lot easier on a technical basis than you might think. Beyond that, you must defend everywhere, but the attacker need only find one problem in your system and have some patience to get in. By analogy, you need to build a strong fence all the way around an entire town to keep out people, but an attacker only needs to find one hole in the fence to wiggle through to get in. Let's start with a common fallacy that obscurity will somehow make you secure. By obscurity, what I mean is an approach to security that involves assuming the attacker does not know how you designed your system or does not know some other secret that is common across all your products. In everyday life, security by obscurity is something like leaving a key under your doormat. Assuming that the key is really a good key, leaving it under your doormat means the attacker doesn't need to know what's in the key. Rather, the attacker just needs to look under the doormat and see if the key is there. In other words, leaving the key under your doormat is not secure. Now, there may be some utility in a key under a doormat if it is unlikely for a bad guy to physically walk up to your house, or you're expecting a guest to come to your door a minute or two after you have to leave the house on an errand. But in general, permanently storing a key under your doormat is probably a bad idea. On the internet, the bad guys don't have to walk from house to house and lift up doormats. Rather, they can write a script that, figuratively speaking, looks under all the doormats of all the houses while they sit back and have a cup of coffee. Now, you might think that this is too simplistic a model for computer security. But consider a security flaw that was found in millions of hotel room computerized door locks. Each door lock had a maintenance port on the outside of the door, enabling an attacker to just plug in from the hallway, scan the lock's memory for its secret key, and then feed the key to the lock, causing the door to pop open. Basically, the key to the lock was hidden under the doormat. This sort of attack is not unusual. Rather, it's all too common. Attackers are clever and resourceful, and they know lots of tricks, and they have lots of time to figure things out. If you think you're more clever than an attacker, think again. Once an attacker figures out weaknesses in your system, the attacker can build a tool to attack you, and then the attacker can distribute the tool and use it across the network, so millions of systems can be attacked from the comfort of the attacker's home once one bad guy finds one flaw in your system. Beyond just avoiding obscurity, 
good security usually ends up relying upon strong cryptographic algorithms and strong cryptographic keys. Kirchhoff's principle from 1883 holds that security should entirely rest on the secret encryption key and not on anything else. In fact, a cryptographic system should be completely secure, even if everything about it is made public, including all the source code. The only thing that should need to be kept a secret is the particular secret key value used for a particular system. Even very complicated secret algorithms can be broken just by looking at encrypted messages without ever seeing the original algorithm. This has been proven many times over, but a famous example is the Lorenz cipher used by the German high command in World War II, codenamed Tunny. This cipher was broken years before the Allies ever saw the encryption or had any information about its design. If you are not a professional cryptographer, it only gets worse. As a rule, homemade or proprietary cryptography is breakable, often shockingly breakable. You should use only vetted, publicly available cryptographic algorithms and security protocols. You should also use only vetted implementations that represent best practice. Perhaps surprisingly, the versions of algorithms and protocols found in textbooks often have subtle security flaws. Any secret, such as a secret cryptographic key or password, should not only be very strict in terms of being long and random, but should never be shared among multiple copies of your product. If you put a single master password in multiple units in the field, it will eventually leak out, if for no other reason then someone will reverse engineer one unit so that they can get the master password to the other units. Reverse engineering includes, potentially, acid etching the chip via what is known as a chip peel so they can recover the program or data inside. Thus, every single item manufactured should have its own unique secret key. No record of the key should be kept at the factory because keeping a key database simply makes the database the focus of an attack and not the product. In the end, you often get pushed towards public key cryptography, at least to support an initial information exchange to set up session keys. Just to reinforce the importance of some of these points, here are three real-world examples of system failures. In 2015, some students were able to hack into a pacemaker killing, fortunately, it was only a simulated patient. But these were not security experts. Rather, students with a basic background in IT and computer science were able to brute force a Wi-Fi protected setup pin using off-the-shelf hacking tools. Back in 1999, DVD movie protection was broken when it was discovered that only a 40-bit encryption key was being used, and at that, only some of the key values were actually potentially valid. That enabled a brute force attack, which could be implemented by programs so simple, people turned them into ASCII art, like this picture of a DVD logo that's actually the decryption program. In 2008, a 14-year-old boy made a homemade transmitter that was able to operate the switches in a city's tram line. That resulted in derailing four trams and multiple injuries. He made his transmitter by converting an old TV remote to be compatible with the train system. Even if you use strong cryptography and strong keys, how you use cryptography also matters. First, use the right cryptographic mechanism for the job. In particular, encryption should be used for secrecy, not for authentication. Rather, authentication should be done via a secure hash or digital signature algorithm, which does not hide information, but does provide tamper detection. Next, don't forget about export restrictions on strong cryptography. Meeting export requirements might require using short keys that weaken your security. However, in many cases, there is no key strength restriction on hashes or signatures. So this means that using them for integrity 
might provide much better security than encryption because you are legally permitted to use longer key lengths. Consider the assumptions you're making for security. It is dangerous to assume that you are secure simply because you're using a proprietary network protocol. Network protocols are fairly easy to hack. Here's an example of someone who hacked a proprietary car network protocol. They were able to forge messages on a controller area network CAN bus that let them send fake speed signals to the dashboard and in general raise a lot of havoc. Even if physical access to the network seems unlikely, firewalls often have problems as well. For example, the davis Bessey nuclear power plant was attacked by the Slammer Internet Worm in 2003 because of an unauthorized connection that bypassed the firewall. This sort of thing happens all the time. You must assume that customers will leave the default configuration in place. Therefore, you should make sure that the system configuration out of the box is secure in its default state. Finally, make sure the system is usable. This can certainly be a tricky trade-off. So consider, people usually prefer weak passwords if they can get away with it. But if you make them enter extremely strong, very random passwords, probably they'll just write it down on a sticky note and put it on the equipment. If the bad guys can physically see the equipment, that's going to be a problem. An especially difficult problem in embedded systems occurs when there's a safety critical control system that's communicating with infotainment systems or even the internet. As an example, if you're in an airplane and look at the entertainment system, you're looking at something that is probably run by desktop software. But that something ultimately is talking to other computers that are more critical to the use of the airplane. Where do you think the altitude comes from? It's not coming from the internet, it's coming from inside your airplane. It's common to see systems such as these running Windows or Linux or other operating systems that are more typically associated with desktop computing rather than safety critical systems. Securing a system that has both safety critical and infotainment or internet access is difficult and it's made more difficult if the various pieces of the system have to talk to each other. It's common in applications such as cars and airplanes to have a situation in which eventually everything needs to talk with everything else. In this picture, as an example, for an airplane, the flight controls may be at the bottom, and then there's a gateway between that and the real-time vehicle management, things like navigation and lighting. There's a gateway between that and infotainment, and there's another gateway where passenger electronics may be able to connect into the infotainment system. If you think about things simplistically, you would say, well, gee, there's no way in the world I want my passenger carried electronics to be able to talk to my flight controls. And you're not trying to do that on purpose. But what you find out is the flight controls need to talk to the vehicle management for things like weather forecasts and mission planning. The vehicle management needs to talk to the infotainment so the infotainment system can display plane altitude, expected time of arrival, things like that. And the passenger electronics have to talk to something. So while you are not directly trying to connect the electronics to the safety critical flight controls, eventually you can get there with multiple hops because everything has to be talking to its neighbor. Mitigating this kind of risk requires a lot of attention to detail and many different types of mechanisms. For example, you can insert a firewall. So when we have a gateway, you'd want to put a firewall in there to restrict the type of traffic that can get through. You probably also want to add integrity checks and data fields and use some sort of cryptographic to support to make sure that the passenger electronics cannot forge a message that goes directly to the flight controls. You can encrypt. It's probably better to use digital signatures and other authentication mechanisms. But the catch is that ultimately everything's connected to everything, so you have to pay a lot of attention to security. Making things worse. Legacy embedded networks are completely insecure. There's no encryption, there's no authentication, and all the integrity checks are non-secure checks such as CRCs on a good day or checksums and parity on a bad day. Retrofitting existing equipment and improving embedded networks that are widely used in industry is a long-term challenge that remains generally open. Getting secure communications inside the bounds of an embedded system is a very tricky area. 
Ideally, what you'd say is, well, I'll put an air gap in, meaning that there's no actual wire connecting the system to anything else. But that's just infeasible because there's huge demand for internet connected devices and general improved functionality. So while that was the story that used to be told, that's just unrealistic these days. A lot of the approaches involve putting in a firewall and rejecting risky packets. But over time, we're going to see pressure to actually change the communication protocols inside embedded systems to be more secure. This area has a lot further to go, and you'll be seeing continued research and continued pressure to improve the security inside embedded systems over many coming years. You should use cryptography properly, and you should also do penetration testing to help ensure security. But it's important to keep in mind that even if you do all these things, that won't necessarily be enough. A key limitation to typical penetration testing for security is that it finds the currently known problems. But what about the problems that aren't known? Some problems are not known until after they're exploited. These are called zero-day vulnerabilities. Originally, the idea was that you would have some sort of vulnerability, it would be discovered and published, and attackers would show up days or weeks or months later to exploit it. But then over time, as it became known that having a list of vulnerabilities was valuable, you would find out that the attacks happened the same day that the vulnerability was discovered, or right now, a lot of times things are being attacked and nobody even knows the vulnerability is there. The bottom line is that vulnerabilities will be discovered after you ship, and you're going to have to issue patches. To illustrate this point, here's a shopping list of zero-day exploits. This is a bit old, but the point is that there's a market for these types of things, and you can see, depending on the piece of software, the exploits might be worth between 5,000 and a quarter million US dollars. In fact, this market is so lucrative that there are companies whose entire business model is finding vulnerabilities in software and instead of revealing them, selling them to the highest bidder. This problem is not going to get any better. Attacks are going to increase over time. The value of vulnerabilities will increase over time. And so you're going to have to have a plan for responding to emergent threats. In particular, you're going to need to worry about how you're going to deal with a vulnerability in software you already have in products that have been shipped to customers, and now all of a sudden you know that they're insecure. While you can't be perfect, the cheapest way to fix a vulnerability is to not ship it in the first place. So if you're writing your own software, you should refer to a list of common weaknesses from MITRE that talks about the types of mistakes people usually make when they're writing their software. But don't forget, not only do you have to have your code secure, but you also have to worry about defects that may be in libraries and packages from other sources. Over the years, a huge number of systems that are completely insecure have been foisted off on unsuspecting customers as being secure through the use of security snake oil. These are false claims that are designed to make you think your system is secure, even though it's not. If you hear these types of claims, you should simply assume the system is insecure and not believe what they're telling you. The first class of snake oil is when people claim that their system is secure because they keep the design information a secret. They'll say things such as, our system is so sophisticated, no one could ever figure out how to break in, and we won't tell you how we do it because if we told you, someone might be able to break in. Or, we have a proprietary cryptographic algorithm that is better than anything else out there, but we're not going to tell you how it works. Anything that boils down to saying that part of the security argument is we won't tell you how it works is usually insecure. A good system is secure even if the actual system designer, with complete knowledge of how the system works, cannot break in unless that system designer has access to the secret key being used on the particular system that he wants to break into. To be clear, sometimes there are secure systems where they don't publish to the entire public all the details of how it works, but typically those also involve one or more trusted third parties that come in and audit the design. In that case, they may say, well, we're not going to publish things because we don't want a bunch of people to figure out where the flaws are, and it may not be quite as bad as the usual snake oil. But the reality is, the best security is one where you can openly publish the design and it doesn't do the bad guys any good. Another form of snake oil is techno babble. People just throw cryptographic buzzwords right and left to the point that you're not even sure what they're saying. If you don't understand what they're saying, probably that's because they don't want you to, and it probably means they're not secure. 
It should be very easy to understand the argument why they're secure, and it should be a design you can look at, understand, and say, yep, that design conforms with best practice, and that's secure. In other words, technobabble is a way of appearing to be transparent, but really trying to keep things secret, because the buzzwords don't actually tell you what's going on. Some systems will claim we're unbreakable. That's simply false. Nobody's unbreakable. The best you can do is to have a sufficiently high cost to break. All cryptography can be broken, if by no other reason than brute force attack. The claim of security should be based on rigorous engineering design, conformance to standards and best practices, and a credible argument that it would take too much time, too much effort, and too much cost to get past the security. Finally, the trickiest one is people will make strong claims about weak systems. As an historical example, in 2008, there were some hard drives that came out that said they used AES, which is in fact a good cryptographic algorithm for encrypting the data on the disk. But they didn't actually do that. What they did was they used AES for encrypting the password, the key for the disk, and that resulted in a particular value. Then that value was XORed with all the data on the disk. That's right, the same value was used to XOR across the entire data of the disk. In order to attack the system, all you needed was one known sector of data. You could take the known value, XOR it with the encrypted value, extract the key, and decrypt the entire disk with basically zero effort. So they said, oh yeah, we use strong cryptography, but they used it in such a ridiculous way that it provided almost no security at all. Also check for things like secret keys being sent unencrypted. That's a common mistake. And always ask, does the manufacturer have a backdoor device key or other way into the system? Here is a summary of the best practices we've discussed. Avoid security via obscurity because it just does not work. Never use a master password that is the same across multiple items that you've manufactured. As an example, you might have seen news stories about roadside construction signs that have been hacked with fake warnings about the zombie apocalypse and so on. These attacks, while wrong and probably illegal, are made easier than they should be by the password scheme used on at least some of these roadside signs. For example, in this sign, there's a four-letter default password that is set at the factory and often not changed. But even if the crew did change the default password, there's another unchangeable four-letter factory password that resets the system to the original factory default. This makes it really easy to break into the sign and reset the password. Such an approach is simply not secure. Back to the list of best practices. You should also avoid using homemade or proprietary cryptography because it is almost always flawed. You should use encryption for secrecy, but you should use digital signatures or secure hashes for integrity and authentication. You should also make sure your security assumptions are realistic. For example, you should never assume that a user will change a default password if they have a choice not to. In the end, getting security right is very subtle and complex. For systems in which a security lapse can result in a high-risk situation, you should get security advice from an expert.